<sighs> you have the zapper. There's Chloe. I didn't know Chloe's were with us. She's wonderful. Who are you? Save your energy. Oh my God. Someone thinks she's gonna be 70. Is she? Huge? How old was Lucy when we got her? Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. She's adorable. Uh oh. Don't step in it. Launch workout. For as long as I covered the world of business, every CEO of America said they had a fiduciary duty to shareholders. Everything was in the name of profits. So after decades of explicitly saying the shareholders were the highest end of the corporation, they point out the corporation is to their customers, to their suppliers. Let me know when you want to have this discussion. Look at them. <laughs> she likes her now. But in many ways, it's a return to an earlier era. An era a century when these other stakeholders battle in a way that they haven't for so many years. And what is that era? You go back to the 1930s. <laughs> Look at her. Make sure Chloe follows us properly. Come on. 
subscribe to Talking Green now so you don't miss a single episode. Hey, it's Theo Bell. You might know my name from Credits Every Week. I make The Daily. One of the biggest stories that we've tackled on The Daily recently is what's going on at the border. And we'll come into our morning meeting. Did you give... Did you give JD the feedback on the videos requested yesterday? And we'll have a million questions. That's why we've called Caitlin Richardson so many times. Because very often we'll get on the phone with her and say, Caitlin, what does this mean? Or what are you hearing? And that's because Caitlin Dickerson, New York Times reporter, knows the answers. But sometimes nobody else does. Because she's been the person who's broken open the story of the family separation policy. She's never given up trying to figure out what's happening. She brings all of that to her reporting and she brings that to the Daily so that listeners can understand what's going on. If the work that we do on the Daily is important to you, the best way to honor that is to become a subscriber to the New York Times. You can do that at nytimes.com subscribe. Andrew, once the idea of the shareholder takes hold in the U.S., how does that actually play out? How does corporate behavior change? It manifests itself first in the form of what became known as corporate readers. Investors basically started knocking on the door of companies saying, you need to make more profits, and if you don't, we're going to take you over. And what period is this This is the 1980s. A certain breed of stock market investor, the kind with lots of money and lots of guts, to thrive in queasy times like these. This is greed is good. This is the midst of this sort of rush around Wall Street, around capitalism. Carl Icahn is one of that breed. He has a knack for turning someone else's loss into profit for himself. And you had some very early investors like Carl Icahn. There's some of the biggest companies in the world, the TWAs of the world, one of the biggest airlines in the country. Go to companies like U.S. Steel and say, I'm going to buy you. Got some breaking news for you. Uh, this time, Carl Icahn is at it again. He has offered to buy commercial metal for $15 a share. He already owns them. I'm going to take you over. I'm going to throw your CEO out. I'm going to lay off scores of employees. I'm going to undo all the benefit programs, and I'm going to manage this company in a much leaner way. That was the euphemism, leaner. Because leaner was, in their minds, leaner was more profitable. Does she need a ride? ...were emboldened by this new guiding philosophy that it was good and right to cut the fat of the excess and increase profits. And that that was actually the socially responsible thing to do how ruthless it might have seemed. Absolutely. And what did Friedman had almost turned it into a moral. So that these investors had a moral underpinning for what they were doing. And how does that era of over grades affect the larger American business? Very short. 